נכון, כי זה סוגר את זה. כשסוגרים זה אוטומטית נסגר הכל. כי כתוב שאם רוצים להתחיל מה זאת, פשוט צריך לפתוח את הדלת, שזה טוב, אבל אם אתה בטעות סוגר את הדלת, אז זה עושה את הדבר ההפוך. אז הוא נתקע לי ברגליים, אמרתי למה זה לא, זה אפקט סוף סמסטר נראה לי. מה? לא דיברתי על מקרה, דיברתי על ה-Human Factor. בסדר, הוא לא רע, הוא זרק את הדלת וככה הוא חירבש לנו את המקרה. מעניין באמת למה הם מתכוונים, דן וסוואט. סוני? הוא עוד לא מראה אותנו. אוקיי, let's start. תגיד, אתה יכול לסגור את הדלת? כשאני יודע, אם אתה אוהב לסגור דלתות, אז... טח, נקבע מקרה. זה לא הדלת ההיא, זה הדלת הזאת שסגרת אותו. אוקיי. אוקיי. אז... אוי, חגיגי. אנייהו. אוי, חגיגי. חגיגי, לא חגיגי, חגיגי, אין לך. אוקיי, לא תחשבו על זה. תשמעו את כל הכל קוגניטיב אפרט לדלסטים. אז אני רוצה להתחיל את הלאסט סשן, עם משהו שאני חושב שאני חושב שיש לי איזה חשוב לעשות, וזה ה-RSVP, ומה ה-RSVP נכון לעשות, ולמה אני... I feel that I want to present to you the RSVP from last lesson again. It was because what I was trying to show you was limited by things that I consider irrelevant, but this remains to be shown, namely, that we can perceive um, clear, let's say, uh, base level categories, even very, when they are presented very briefly and we don't have a specific prediction for what we are about to see, and we don't have a lot of time to consider it afterwards, that is the rapid theory of visual presentation, uh, and the idea was to contrast the prediction of uh, uh, the idea that what we actually look for is just to, or what, what we actually try to minimize is prediction error, which predicts that if, we have, if something comes out of the blue, it will take us <laughs> our hypothesis regarding Dropbox. <laughs> okay. Uh, Why did, it, why did it pop out uh, last time? We thought it was because something that was presumably corrected. Anyhow, irrelevant. Don't think about it. So, this is the idea. We have limited cognitive resources, so don't spare them. Um, so the idea is that we... Uh, the question is, what is it that takes a lot of time? Obviously, and I don't think anybody disputes it, If we have clear predictions, it facilitates the process of perception, it facilitates everything, because we don't need to do all the processes. And as you said two lessons ago, this is not specific to any of these uh, uh, hypotheses in the sense that, yeah, when we know what we're looking for, it facilitates processes. The question is, okay, what happens if we don't know? How quick can we do it? And in terms of prediction error, it's kind of a process that will, in a way, converge only when across all stages of processing, uh, inconsistencies have been resolved, so you are consistent across different levels of resolution. And what I try to present is one alternative, which is the reverse hierarchy uh, 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 concept and prediction, and this is that if all you need, which is typically in daily situations, is just the gist in terms of the incoming uh, stimulus, just the gist of what's going on, because you have 
uh, lots of other stuff and you don't need more, or because all you need to do is just identify the gist level, okay? Often you have good predictions, but if you don't, the gist, the level of uh, the category without the details can be perceived very quickly, even if you don't have a prediction, and you actually, according to this interpretation, you actually need to go backwards, so to, to actively go backwards, only when crude information is not sufficient, it's not an essential process in order to perceive, uh, and you don't have to have fully compatible representation across the different layers. One of the benefits of this hierarchy is the different levels of the hierarchy focus on different aspects of the stimuli. Higher level is like categorical level, and different uh, stages of or different levels of representations have um, detailed, more detailed representation in different aspects, and you don't need to be very specific unless you ask to. So going down is a task-related process. That said, the prediction of, 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 of RHT is that you, um, you, you'll be able to quickly perceive category level, but not detail. So crude categories you're well familiar with, uh, clearly uh, perceived in terms of being large, we're familiar with, even if you don't have a long online processing time. And I wanted to show you that with the RSVP last time, however, we had a series of pictures, right? And the series was like 10 pictures. And then when I asked you, did you see a red car? And said, I don't know. Okay, and the question was, did you see it at a time but it was not kept because of working memory limitations? Or was it a perceptual limitation? Okay? And we left it there, roughly. Of course, my tendency was obvious, but it still remains to be shown, right? So um, I was thinking, what should I do in order to resolve this problem? And actually, I um, thought of lesson two. What did we, what did we think of? <laughs> what was in lesson two? So lesson two was about working memory. So, so, okay, so if I don't want, if I wanted to be quick, but still within the limits of working memory, what should be the implications? Well, it took me a while, so it's not surprising that you don't have it uh, immediately. Just have fewer pictures, right? Ten is a lot. One should work. But one is a problem, right? Because one is kind of maybe you have something that goes afterwards or something like this. You don't stop because you know this. It's not masked by subsequent stimuli, so maybe it doesn't mean much. And so I thought three should work. Three is kind of what we can manage. Okay. So here's the presentation. It's just RSVP, same rate but cut to three. Okay. That where presumably your ability to say, okay, what were the stimuli that you saw is not limited by working memory. Okay? Let's see if it works. It's the first time ever. Please be nice. Okay. Ready? I will ask you, well, see as much, see and retain as much as you can. Okay? Well, that was quick. <laughs> I should press this. And then what? <laughs> I don't say, I mean, what should I do? Click twice? Let's go for twice. Th no. <laughs> what? What? And then what? I press. Okay. Now here? Yeah? Open? Okay. That was... Wait. <laughs> okay, let's do it again. Cause that, okay, ready? Okay, what did you see? Okay, I heard nothing, but what... what Okay. Did you see three items? Did you see the same three items? Okay. Now that you have the general ability, let's see it on a different movie that you don't have, uh, right? Okay. We've got the idea. You're prepared. Let's see if I manage to find it. What do I do? So, close it. Do that. No, double right. Open. Don't look, don't look. Wait a minute. Oof. Sorry. 
I'll do it once again. Now you're all ready. That will be the last time, and I hope you see three items. You saw two? You saw any? No, the question is, which did you see? Who saw the young guy? Everybody, right? Right? Uh, what else? Uh, the chopper is a difficult one. So, how, just, how, okay, everybody saw more than one? So the question is who saw two and who saw three? Did anybody see three? Okay, so about half of you saw three. So the class is split between prediction error, reverse hierarchy, half and half, and I'm joking. It's a joke. Okay, but that's the idea. Um, I should learn how to do this demo better, but that was the concept. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not that uh, concerned about the results. It's about, again, the idea is, okay, how can we test this? What does it mean, et cetera, et cetera? And how could we do better demos is one of the questions. I will not answer that, but I did some way. Okay. How does Andy Clark receive your reverse artists? Yeah, yeah, how do theories sit together? Right? Do they sit together at all? Like, they're represented in the Andy Clark paper and the reverse artists do. So what I, was trying, what I was trying to do is kind of to compare. The, some of the things are, I mean, in a way they belong to the same school of thought in the sense that um, uh, that the hierarchy is crucial in terms of uh, learning and in terms of perception and that predictions are formed at a relatively high level of the, of the hierarchy which has lots of benefits. Uh, benefit is that it's general. In this respect, it also sits with, I mean, is, is, is consistent with the conceptualization of uh, hierarchical Bayesian inferences, which again, it's another question, how does it relate to prediction error? Because they're not all specifically addressed to this focus on the same question. So it's not like three related answers to the same question. The focus is somewhat different. So it's not very trivial how to compare it, but I was sort of trying to pitch them in a way and pitch predictions against the other. So the idea that the uh, predictions are important, they're formed at a high level, which is more general. And who presented a little bit, actually, uh, you presented a little bit like, the, the, the bliss of obstruction, which is kind of the point of view of the reverse um, of the um, Bayesian inference, because if you have if your hypothesis is initially very very broad in general, it kind of reduces the number of parameters, the space of parameters, which is kind of easier to make predictions. And in this respect, it's very similar to the conceptualization of reverse hierarchy, because the idea is that the limiting the, the limiting bottleneck in a way is how much you can process at a given time. So you can do that either at the crude resolution, which is often uh, reasonably good for um, ecological conditions because you're not, don't, you don't need to have the resolution of all the things that got you into the categorical decision, whether it's speech and you care about the content of a conversation or it's, a, or it's object and you're interested whether it's a chopper but not exactly what it's composed on. If you are interested in its components, then you actively do that. Um, so in this respect, they're all, I think, similar. Uh, I think the difference is, is again, how, for instance, some things are, were not really specified, so it's not that any of them was really fully specified in terms of what does it, what does it take to form uh, um, an, an, ex, an, explicit predict, an explicit perception, okay? What, 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 is, what is mapped to, the, to our visual experience? Do you have, for instance, in prediction error to have fully nulled uh, um, prediction errors? Uh, in, in reverse hierarchy, it's kind of the gist is there, so it's kind of, and it's oriented towards understanding specific phenomena, so it's kind of resolved to the extent that it addresses the phenomena it was aimed to, to, to um, address. And one of the things that I thought were different was, was exactly why I came up with this, uh, uh, with this RSVP presentation is like, how important is prediction? 
And everybody in all of these hypotheses is a top-down based rather than bottom-up based. These kind of predictions are important, but at what level do they play a role, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots of differences. And I think mainly they were aimed to explain somewhat different phenomena, so they are not completely you know, specified across all situations to be compared to the other. Something doesn't well with theory. Something doesn't what? Doesn't Well, if you think that everything in a way is a loop, okay, so you start the analysis from some point, but it's not like, you know, things, what you have here is somewhat of a consequence of what was one step ago in time. So why does it start here? And I mean, it's like, you can say starting, if you're in a, in a psychophysical situation, often you have black screen and then you have something onset and then, aha, it's an onset of a situation. But in most situations, it's kind of, okay. Where do you start now in terms of prediction error? It's, a kind of, it's, it's not out of nowhere, so the predictions. Where do the predictions come from, right? So they come from somewhere that has to do with the one step earlier or several uh, time constants. This is one of the reasons I wanted to introduce the sensory motor part. But everybody will agree to some extent it's closed loop, but almost nobody addressed this. Because if you want to have both the hierarchies and the sensory motor and everything, it gets extremely complicated. So like the sensor, when I talked about the sensory motor loops, I said, yeah, there's forward model, inverse model, but we didn't address the issue of hierarchies, which gets it more complicated. So, so people would agree. If you saw Talib Tishby's uh, nice slide, which he didn't make, it was taken from Fuster, where you have several hierarchies that are perceptual, several hierarchies that are motor, and they kind of loop with the other, etc., etc. It's kind of very vague. How to actually implement it is extremely complicated. So it's kind of, I think, the fact that it starts here, okay, let's see at the, the lower level, it's just because he wants to address the bottom-up kind of uh, process. So let's say what happens at the level of the, beyond the eye, let's say one level afterwards, okay? So then we look at the prediction error and it starts there. But it's, it's, it, it, to, to a large extent, it's an arbitrary decision, okay? Because predictions are a consequence of earlier events, etc. So it's kind of... But nobody actually integrates all these complexities into a single realistic model. Okay. <coughs> uh, so for the last lesson, what I wanted to focus on was potential applications. Okay, potential. Are there potential applications? I mean, we're into basic research, but one of the fields that an interesting question is, what is an application? For instance, we have this dispute now in, 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 psycho in the psychology department. I don't know if dispute. Discussion. Discussion. In psychology department of what forms clinical psychology. Is it about when you study a clinical population, but your question is not directly necessarily therapeutic. It could be basic research that addresses the clinical population. Is it a clinical study? Does it make a difference? To some extent, it makes a difference. It doesn't necessarily, I don't know, I can, <laughs> it's because they're representative of individuals dealing with uh, clinical populations. And it's an open question. And the funny thing was that I had this discussion very recently in the department, and Jonathan Hooper, who happens to be now the uh, clinician, who is the head of the psychology department, said, of course, any study on a clinical population, even if it's basic research, it's a clinical study because... I don't know because what, but because I didn't think it was a clinical study, but it's, so it's kind of clinical, but the, perhaps the most, the, the really relevant question, or, or the, the deep question, is what is the type of studies, we don't know, but what is the type of studies that is likely to make, now this is a very fancy word, translational effect. And what is the idea of translational effect? They wouldn't remain in the basic research realm of understanding, but it will, it is likely, nobody knows whether it's, it's not guaranteed, but it is likely to have a clinical application in terms of rehabilitation, okay? What is, is, what, what is the type of basic research that has great prospects of sort of giving a boost to potential therapeutic processes? 
And there is a big effort by some, I think it's an open question and highly debated issue, whether computational psychiatry is, has this potential. And the, <laughs> beyond me, you know, it's beyond me. <laughs> um, so, for instance, I just want to, before I, before I let you present your paper, just to give you an example for one of the, so, so in a way, I think one of the real big questions, the question is schizophrenia in terms of mechanisms. I mean, obviously it's a very, very, I don't care. it's a very, very important question to understand schizophrenia. And there's a big gap in what terms, like psychiatric, but all sorts of, of, of related difficulties. Where is the gap? Here, for instance, which is potentially calling for some bridging, is that if you, if you look at the DSM, DSM is kind of the diagnostics, the formal ways of diagnosing uh, um, um, neurological deficits. Um, it's, let's just, just for two minutes go through it because I want to make a point, not that you have to, it's not, it's, I took this apart just to give you the flavor of what makes uh, uh, the definition of schizophrenia. So that looks, <coughs> let's look at, and I want you to, to notice something about the type of, of definition. So characteristic symptoms, so the DSM is a whole very big book with many, many, whatever is considered worthwhile of a separate categorical uh, diagnostics is defined in, for instance, in this church. So characteristic symptoms, two or more of the following, each present for a significant portion of time during a one month period or less if successfully treated. Delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior, and there are also negative symptoms. Uh, um, it's kind of, uh, the negative symptoms are more like depression, you don't have incentive to do stuff, so there's positive stuff, which is hallucination, and there's a uh, negative part, which is just, I don't know, it's not the reverse, but it's kind of less contact, and, 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 and individuals don't have them at the same time, but they have periods of that and periods of that, and there's a lot of uh, other uh, specifications which are not what I want to focus about. What is obvious here is the level at which these deficits are defined. And this level is behavioral, okay? So the nature of, of the difficulties uh, that, that, that needs to be addressed or that are relevant for their diagnostics are behavioral, uh, perceptual, motor, cognitive, but in a way you could say in a very broad way, a cognitive phenotype, okay? okay? So like the behavioral characteristics which are abnormal and the list of them constitutes the deficit that is diagnosable. On the other hand, how do you go about it? Well, there's no real good treatment for schizophrenia, but if you think about the nature of the medications, okay, so wh what level do the medications address? So the level of medications address, uh, you know, the, the names are not important for, for our purpose. The point is that they address serotonin and dopamine, so they address the neurotransmitter level, and now, Here's the gap, okay? So, so the medication is aimed at the, at the neurotransmitter. The description of the behavioral abnormalities is, is very, very cognitive. And the question is, do we understand the relation? And the question is, one, do we understand it in any general conceptual way? And whether introducing a computational model is relevant? And after your presentation, I hope you'll have very, a, a, a little time after the author, I hope we'll have little time to discuss what do we think about the potential of computational analysis in terms of actually bridging these levels and what kind of computational models we think in, in advance have the higher prospects of being useful. And useful, what does that mean? Okay, so keep that in mind and I hope that after the present we'll have little time to discuss it. So what you're going to present is uh, no. You can you, as your as your setting uh, at your computer for the presentation. So the idea is um, this is a very short review, very recent review, of course, that aims to present the potential of computational psychiatry.
there are uh, many categories but majorly people consider learning and decision making and the computational tools that uh, we use are reinforcement learning and basic learning. So uh, the major, both of these uh, tools have the same foundation of statistical principles uh, and we uh, measure the prediction error. In reinforcement learning, the prediction error is weighted by the learning rate and in Bayesian theory, the prediction error is uh, weighted by the uncertainty. Uh, we have two types of reinforcement learning, model based and model free. Uh, there are several studies which say that these two are different, but recently there are studies which say that these two are implemented in the same brain region. For example, ventral striatum, which is activated in case of model based and model three. I don't remember the exact name of the study. And uh, in this review paper, they are basically uh, forcing on the idea of Bayesian theory. Uh, they are saying that uh, they are focusing on the Bayesian brain hypothesis, which view the brain as a constructing and continuously updating generating model of a sensory input. And the, uh, the goal of the model is to minimize its free energy in uh, order to remain in the state which is uh, physiological uh, possible or which is within physiological bounds. So what are these generative models and how are they implemented? Uh, Leo is going to talk about that. So
right, about the, the measured data. However, this is this is not, not sufficient. The, the classic uh, forward model. If we want, if we also want to make some uh, uh, to use uh, to use it as a diagnostic tool. Okay, so we would use something else. Uh, okay, so what we do need is uh, models of neuron population dynamics, which are sufficiently simplified to enable parameter estimation. Uh, model inversion, yet sufficiently detailed that they retain a meaningful summary of uh, uh, physiological uh, processes. So actually, we're, we're looking for some some functional readouts using which uh, we could we could use this as a, some kind of a diagnostic tool, uh, the generated model. Why? Uh, because in psychiatry, as mentioned before, we can take like, a tissue samples from patients, right? This is actually the, the opposite uh, process. We're going uh, from uh, the data, and the model would estimate the posterior probability. Okay, so if previously in the forward uh, generated model, we were asking, given this change in parameters, what would be the change in behavior or cognitive dysfunction or brain activity? Now we, we have we're starting from the measurement, and we're trying to, to detect some some uh, um, the unknown pathophysiological mechanisms. Okay. Uh, so, um, um, one established uh, uh, dynamic causal uh, modeling, okay, which is a, a Bayesian system identification framework um, that that is aimed to, to uh, make inferences and to to predict the the coupling or um, or the causal interactions between brain regions and how how this coupling. Is affected by the experimental paradigm. Okay, so we'll see we'll see one example for that. Okay, okay, and so here they they wanted to ask in this study whether connectivity is uh, performed by parietal uh, and network underlying working memory is altered in all schizophrenia patients. Okay, so what you do usually when you when you uh, uh, when you use the dynamic Gaussian modeling is to start with regions of interest. So they started uh, with the parietal, uh, uh, the dorsal uh, frontal, and the visual cortex. Okay, so now we want to add to make inferences about the direction of, uh, of connectivity given the, the paradigm is used. What do I mean? You have this, the connections over here with the normal arrows, right? And you have the walking memory sound. <coughs> so we, we actually tr we're actually trying to, to figure out what are, what are the uh, modulatory inputs. What, okay, for example, they, they had here uh, uh, two groups of uh, one patients, uh, patients and control, and you have uh, two types of drive. One, one type was like pressing a key each time you saw the number zero, and the other one, you had to, it was, it was a working memory trial where you had to press uh, a button each time you saw a number that you've seen two trials earlier. Okay? And then, based on that, Actually, they had the three ratios of interest, and that if you have four on four, 50 possible uh, models for the for the modulation of effective connectivity. Okay, so you have this, and then you four plus four, right? Oh, <coughs> those four. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, what do they tell for? Uh, for possible models, they wanted they started from from uh, observed data. The observed data was uh, uh, the uh, they wanted to. The, the observed data was uh, uh, the well-known uh, uh, walking memory uh, impairments uh, within uh, uh, schizophrenic patients. Okay. So now we wanted to ask if this this, this function can be the walking memory uh, that yeah. during the walking memory time. Okay. For example, we have those two. Just these two. Okay. So here you have. Uh, okay. You have some kind of of, uh, uh, of uh, both signals between those areas in the in the zero trial. You just have to press zero with now. And now we have you get in another uh, set of trials where you have some walking memory uh, 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 related data. So now we want to ask if those were were decreased here for the for the schizophrenic patients. That is the the difference between your performance. Not the performance, but the activity is, is different in in uh, uh, like if 
this direction. So you have so you have m many many kinds of directions. You have six. So
which areas are important for uh, such kind of behavior and what will happen if one is not working and what is happening if another one is not working. So these are the results of their study and they are basically using unsupervised clustering. There are two kinds of uh, um, techniques that one can use, supervised and unsupervised. In unsupervised clustering, they are not using the idea, okay, we, we, uh, we already have these patients and we can treat these patients with this kind of uh, drug. And I think this is, uh, and in unsupervised, they are not having any uh, previous information about the patient. And they want to uh, distinguish uh, between the symptoms of the uh, schizophrenia not between uh, different kinds of patients on the basis of their behavior. And uh, so out of those uh, different models, they cluster three kinds of models for schizophrenia. And uh, each, uh, so the strength of uh, arrow, it shows the connectivity strength between these two regions. And uh, they, Okay, so in order to uh, validate their results of this clustering process, they did one kind of explain between different models ah, and yeah. different clusters in Yes, so exactly they got uh, 16, let's say 16 different models, and then they clustered those 16 models, and what they found. Uh, this connection between the uh, prefrontal cortex and parietal uh, cortex, this is the uh, same in all the three models. But in case of working memory, this connection is uh, more uh, dominating in one cluster. And whereas in this model, the connection between the parietal cortex and the visual cortex is more dominant. So, in terms of activity, okay. It, 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 in terms of both signals from one direction to the other direction. Yeah, I am. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what is the signal you like? Mm -hmm. Just I'm confused. Mm -hmm. So I, okay, so they are different models, and they are clustering them on the basis of their different nature. They this model is different from this model, this model is different from this model. There may be other clusters which are overlapping, so they are excluding this And uh, that figure is, uh, uh, they have this uh, kind of test which is uh, scores of positive and negative syndrome scale, which is a clinical test for schizophrenic patients. And uh, in this, they found the, that these three clusters are uh, uh, these tests are done on the patient and they found that there are three clusters, there are three group of patients which are significantly different from each other. There is no overlap between these three clusters. So, is it clear? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Any question about this? The, the body for the for the symptoms. Okay. Now after they they did so this. What, what is the nature of the difference between the three clusters, mm -hmm. right? So if you look at the connection between mm -hmm. uh, the dorsolateral prefrontal and the visual cortex, right? It, as you go to the right, it becomes stronger, and the stronger it is, the larger the difficulty, the the, the, the symptoms, the more difficult are the symptoms, the more severe of the patient. Right? I don't think this is the like. This is uh, the direction of uh, I'm looking at this part. Uh, right? Yes. right? The idea is if you look at that, that's the yes. idea. So we have a model and we dissociate some things, but who cares? So one of the ways they validated the interesting part of their of their structuring is that it's related to some kind of clinical etiology, right? Yeah. And here is the clinical measure. And there is the right to so these patients have big more severe clinical limitations compared with this, compared with this, and I'm trying to say why, how is it related to the different pattern of connectivity? I mean, the idea is do we get to understand better what is the answer? 
modulation was right. was the highest for the last one, but it was it was actually negative for the for the middle one. Like when you see the, the dash. Uh, so what you're saying is that this and this gets stronger, right? And this relatively gets weaker. So maybe this is not in the dominant product, but uh, the systems get more severe, something like this. I'm trying to understand whether it's just we're trying to decide for just a technique, okay, we can do some things. And what is kind of best accounts for the data? What is the model that best accounts for the data? Let's optimize, etc. Or we get any insights, right? So, so the thing is, we, we chose to present this uh, um, th those is this specific uh, study because this is this is one example. This is of a new thing using computational models in uh, in psychiatry, and um, and you you, you can actually do two things. You can one option is to you to you to conduct a, a, a supervised uh, clustering on which you give w one of the parameters is the specifically the uh, uh, the symptoms. Yeah, and then you want you want to the clustering to be done according to uh, to the symptoms. Another one is not is disregarding the symptoms, even though you, you previously have the data and plugging them only afterwards, as they did in this. Why? Because you want to sometimes uh, to to, uh, um, to figure out what are the, the mechanisms that underlie something that you don't al always understand so well. For example. This, this disease, which is not quite understood. Right? Okay, so some code giving the patterns are correlated with some symptoms and with some major more severe symptoms, and some connectivity patterns are correlated with less severe mm -hmm. yeah, We also have the, it's correlated, but it, it is, like, you have a causality between, it's not like the two ways. Based on what is the it's not, no, wait, it's not, it's not causality of correlation, of the correlation between this, what ah, you can see right. in the arrow, it's causality because you can see, you differentiate the two, the two yeah. sideways. Uh -huh. The direction?
פותח, זה יהיה ביומיים האחרונים. כי היום הראשון לדעתי הוא פיזיקה, אז זה הופך את זה בעצם יומיים האחרונים של הכנס, שזה יהיה הראשון ביוני ושני. אני חושב שיש... שהבעיה היא אחרת ממחשב שלך. מה הבעיה? מה הבעיה? יש איזה משהו אחר שמקפיץ נוטיפיקיישן, נראה לי שזה ה... לא, לא, זה לא הדרופו. כן. יכול להיות שזה האייקון של ווינדוס 10. כל הזמן הוא רוצה שאני אעשה לווינדוס 10? כל דקה הוא צועק לי... הוא עוד ברור את כל התוכנות? אבל אני יכול לעשות את זה, זה מה שקורה, אני גם, אני כבר, כן, נכון, ללינה, אני כבר נשברתי, המחשב הבא שלי יהיה לינה, למה? כי זה בלתי נסבל כבר הווינדוס הזה, הסיבה היחידה שאני עובד עם ווינדוס, no offense, זה כי את עובדת עם אופי, לא, הווינדוס 8 מוציא אותי מזה, אבל השאלה אם הוא דופס לא, הוא לא יותר טוב. אבל לפחות הוא יפסיק להקפיץ לך את ההודעות שלי. כל הזמן אני שומעת כאילו, שמעתי איזה פרסומות כאלה. החיים שלך היו משמינים, כי לא הכרת את מי הוא יודעת, יש להם כזה. לא, לא. לא, לא, לא. אבל אם אתה תעברי ללינוקס, אז אני גם אעבור. כאילו, הבעיה שאני לא יכול לעבור, אין לי, כאילו, אני לא יכול לעבור. אין אופיס. אין מייקרוסופט אופיס ללינוקס. לא, לא, אבל יש אופיס אחר. יש ליברו. יש לי ווינדוס ואפשר להתקין וויין, כן, אפשר להתקין וויין, אבל וויין, כאילו, זה ווינדוס וירטואלי על... לא אכפת, זה אכפת לי מה אני רואה. מה? כן, זה מבחינתי כמו וויינדוס. אולי, המחשב שלנו מקובל? מבחינתך זה כמו וויינדוס, כן. 
which suggests that the repeated stimuli can be used as an anchor. And so what do you mean by references? What? What do you mean by references? References, it can be auditory reference, like the songs they should um, compare between two songs, but then if one of them is a, is a constant or in small range, such simple regularities, that's why uh, the, the anchor doesn't help them. Here it suggested that the benefit is from the stimuli statistics and not from the repetition. The repetition is not necessarily helpful, uh, as we will see. Okay, so the model. The experiment is uh, to distinguish between uh, two zones to uh, decide which uh, and the participant uh, decision, decision, <coughs> decision is made by comparing the, the second tone that they hear to the memory of the first tone, where the memory of the first tone is, uh, is meant as the previous trial that they heard with some uh, weight, and the, the tone that they hear in the current trial uh, with some noise. The parameter that we refer to is the internal noise, the, the variability of the noise, and the weight of uh, the, weight of the uh, memory of that first one. Uh, the reflective uh, <laughs> adjustment for this component is
But the second term isn't drawn from the distribution, right? It's deterministic in general. It's depending on the first term. Uh, right. It's depending in, in the meaning of it, if it will be lower or higher, or closer or far from but the mean. So it's always the same distance from the first term pro for either no. direction? No, no. Of the no, it's not always the same. So it's also, also like okay. probabilistic? I think from the same uh, distribution. Go, go one, go yeah. one, this just was it. So, uh, I think we can get that far. So, <laughs> this one is not me. <laughs> um, so, this was the result for the two term discrimination. So, you have a, a different uh, uh, differences between the two terms, and you can either be in the back plus, meaning the uh, first term is closer to the mean, back minus, uh, the second term is closer to the mean, or back two. And we can see that the controls perform much better in the back plus. Uh, but what are, the, what are the points? And the points are the success ah. rate. Um, uh, the color uh, represents the uh, accuracy uh, in each trial, meaning uh, you will go uh, less accurate, you will go more accurate, and each point represents uh, the F2 frequency and the F1 frequency. Right, so what, how do you derive just the, what is just the F2? Um, so, what is the diagonal? So, the diagonal is when the equal. So, so, what is the distance from the diagonal? So the fact that it's parallel to the diagonal I mean there was here the same difference between them and here was the same difference. So right. In so the same difference from two from two terms to the I think they just have to fix in the multiple. But it could be the higher or lower, right? The first term could be either higher or lower. Mm -hmm. So um, we can see that from they were chosen so that for the average population it yields about eighty percent. Uh, so we can see the controls perform better in the bias plus, and uh, the bias zero that perform uh, both. And but the thing is that in the bias mean they perform much worse, and even worse than the flat in this uh, same trial. So we can see that it's compatible with the fact that we suggest that they suggested that uh, bias plus gives more information to controls. Uh, they can calculate the average better, and back means actually interfere with their calculation, so they perform much worse. And the kind of reflexes are uh, don't perform or perform badly this uh, integration, uh, so they perform uh, less both in the back plus and in the back minus, but back minus will affect controls more. Okay, so. This is more reminder that this line uh, calendar is how well we can separate between a uh, two distribution, in this case the noise and the signal. So they calculated uh, the deep line for each trial um, at uh, they calculated the deep line for each trial type for uh, each uh, participant. So in the control we can see yeah, we can see that the mean is uh, the mean response, the mean decline is going down, meaning that but we can separate it better with the uh, back plus trials and worse in the back minus. And in the surface, it seems pretty much the same. It's also decreasing, but a bit. Um, if we see the decline uh, of the back plus uh, uh, different from the back minus uh, in the C figure, 
uh, you see that, so um, in control it's always positive, meaning if they always could separate better the bad plus than uh, the bad men, and it's also usually larger than the bad uh, for the form F, uh, compared to the dyslexic, which have the smaller differences. And
before the first term. We integrate the first term with the prior uh, information and we compare it to the second term. And the uh, integration only occurs to the first term. So if it's true, when the, if we have a reference term, uh, in the, uh, which is the second term, it won't help us, uh, it won't increase our performance set as much as the reference term that is the first term. I mean, if, if we have the same reference term uh, and then compare uh, different frequencies to it, then if the, this reference is the first term, we get a better accuracy because it can integrate all the, all the reference and it's the same and give us a better representation, can overcome the noise. And if it's the second term, we don't have this integration. So we perform worse, so this is true for control. And this is not true for the sectors because we say they don't perform this integration well. So, uh, yeah. so this was the result. We saw that uh, the model can predict that uh, control can use a similar statistics uh, to increase the performance, while the static, the static uh, can't use the statistics to improve them and actually calculated the weight uh, suboptimally, meaning they have a certain noise level and they don't choose the eta that will bring them best discrimination. They choose a smaller eta and then. And in the EG, we saw that this, uh, this is, in fact, if we have this region when we know. Uh, Corresponds to integration, and we have um, the same response as the device person, but mentioned the statistics, which does happen in control. So the conclusion could be that statistics underway history uh, when they uh, need to perform perceptual decision. Um, but there is an alternative interpretation. Ah, okay, here's the problem. So, um, so they, have, uh, they, they do uh, calculate. Ah, wait, wait. So, so a different interpretation could be that they have just noisy memory. It's, it's not that they don't integrate it uh, well. It's just it's noisy. It's a previous average of the m t minus one. So, this but for this uh, interpretation, we need three parameters, and we have. We also have, we already have a model with two parameters that uh, accounts for the result, so we maybe we don't need an extra parameter. So if we want to stay in the within the two parameter range, um, we need to we need to to assume that they always perform uh, optimally. I mean, they always choose the optimal eta, <coughs> and then we can have uh, just two parameters, which is the noise of the, the perception of the the first term and the noise of the memory. But the assumption of they always uh, find the optimal eta is kind of strong. So, so this model also accounts for the same results, but it has a stronger assumption that the model uh, presented earlier doesn't help. Um, so we asked ourselves, we saw the group different uh, for We group differences uh, for sigma earlier, and so we have to forgive, maybe because we could, uh, if it means that the uh, detectives have higher noise in general, so maybe we should use this interpretation that we need to <coughs> add noise to the memory, maybe they just have noisy brain. So, um, uh, so they gave us this uh, result that they perform the same. Uh, same experiment with larger groups, and here it's less evident that there is um, group differences. So all both controls and uh, detectives have probably close uh, noise levels, but uh, detectives still, but still uh, perform suboptimally. So, um, so in conclusion, if we know that proficient reading highly rely on the uh, trials of the uh, sound sequence 
that are understandable and they can actually be applicable to designing uh, uh, procedures to improve uh, the spectral feeding abilities, for example. So, you just need to compare. <coughs> so you first do it, you remember it, you can do all this calculation on it, and then you will uh, listen to the second tone and you need to you need to choose. Right. So assumption is so what? Then what if you present it first? And you have to remember it and what happens if you don't remember it? Then you have to do it
I think that theoretically, if you try to increase the noise, you can bring a closed subject to, to the mean level of noise that dyslexics show, and then you can try and control for, for the last question of whether the problem is the noise or the problem of, problem is of how to use the noise or how to, how to wait to get it trapped. So right, so I mean, this is similar to what, to what you're suggesting, like uh, find some way to introduce, to increase the noise, right. to well, increase to both control. populations. Okay, to so increase to both populations, and then you can see to what extent control increases their weight, to what extent dyslexics increase their weight from previous trials, right? No, if, if, if the first explanation is that the problem is in the and not in the noise parameter, so I would expect the control subjects to have higher noise, similar to, to, to the level of noise that dyslexics, dyslexics have, but but still show a more optimal weighting of... Right, so I'm not actually similar noise levels and similar. No. Yeah. So, so no, so what you presented faster, is like the last slide was that we did a follow-up study with a different population, and you can select population that... Uh, so the, the last slide, I think, was yeah. a little fast, was a different population with the same amount of general noise, and we still got this distinction. But you so still have like more of a red point to the right than the on, on the average, I don't want to get into, yeah. I don't want to get into the details of actual stuff, but uh, uh, they didn't differ, but we still got this difference. But any other suggestion? What could you think? Would you try to decipher what is the neural mechanism of this phenomenon? And if so, any ideas? Would you try it? There's no question. So this is like... Um, Overexcitability somewhere? The what? Overexcitability somewhere? There's noise? Okay, let's assume there's no, yeah. there's no difference in the noise that there's exists no and the weighting of previous history because somehow there's sub-learning of previous history. So how, what kind of mechanism could you use it? slide which is the uh, I will I will not have time for work I for everything just for one. Um, yeah. No. <laughs> I don't have time for everything. I wanted to show just one slide. Hmm? Yeah that's easy. The other one is complicated. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um so uh, having found that the difference is in the amount of weight that the dyslexic attributes of previous history because they don't integrate as effectively as found by the uh, no difference in P2, whether it's closer to the P2, the ERP component, which is produced by the original corpus, is not very, is not as sensitive as controls for previous statistics, we asked, okay, something perhaps in the integration of previous statistics is not as efficient. So what is the mechanism? We don't know. Uh, but we hypothesize, and one a potential hypothesis. Oh, okay. Um, it's, it's in the title. One potential hypothesis is that if you think about adaptation mechanisms, they're automatic, there's some aspect which is similar specific, and if you introduce lots of stimuli within a given window, it kind of, to some extent, passively or automatically averages across these presentations. So perhaps adaptation, there's some evidence for it, perhaps adaptation is the averaging mechanism. And if it is, maybe something is different in the adaptation processes of the sexes and on the sexes. And cut a long story short, the answer is, the reason I presented is that yes, and what we find is that even if you do passive adaptation, just boom, boom, 